As, uh, as uh, Rex said, my name's Steve Hallett, and I've uh, uh, unfortunately had to step in for Steve Jones, so uh, um, I've got absolutely no clue which order these slides are in for a start, um, so forgive me as I fluff my way through them, okay? Um, so um, apparently this is what I'll be talking about. I'm um, uh, going to give you a little bit of a background on, on ITM, where we've come from. Um, I'm going to move on to looking at uh, our positioning and, and, and how we're approaching the market and where we feel IT, uh, ITM and electrolysis sits um, within the, the overall energy sector. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit about product. Um, we've got several products on the market at the moment um, and, uh, and how we've uh, evolved those products from, uh, from when we started. And then move on to uh, the market sectors, um, how we're producing clean fuel um, and how all of this technology might adapt to work with, uh, with the hydrogen waterways, which is obviously the, the subject of these series of presentations. So um, we've got um, an executive team and a non-executive team. We're a PLC. Uh, we raised money on the stock market some years back. Um, we've got Dr. Graham Cooley as our CEO. Um, Dr. Simon Bourne, who I believe um, has uh, affiliation with the, uh, with the university here. And Barry Cunliffe, who's our CFO. Uh, in addition to that, we've got our non-exec team, including Roger Putnam, um, who used to be the chairman of Ford of Britain. Um, we've got Peter Hargreaves, uh, who is currently the, um, uh, the exec director at Hargreaves Langstown, and Lord, uh, Lord uh, Roger Freeman as well, who's, uh, who's sitting on the board of non-execs. So we started off um, uh, on the stock market. We raised our money uh, back in 2004 based upon a particularly novel material we came up with. It was a hydrocarbon-based material that could be used for electrolysis as opposed to the conventional fluorocarbon materials. Um, uh, and from that, we developed our results and managed to do a secondary round of fundraising back in 2006. Really, the one thing I wanted to take away from this slide is the fact that um, we've come a long way since 2004. Um, we're only halfway through 2012 now, and we've got numerous agreements in place, um, lots and lots of activity. And, and for us, the market has been never, uh, never been such an exciting place for us to, uh, to be involved in. So moving on to our positioning, um, well, there's a challenge that we face, um, and I think the Scottish are going to feel it worse than anybody else, but um, uh, the, the, there's a real problem with renewable energies, and that is that you can't schedule when they're going to be on, when they're going to be able to produce electricity from renewables. And the best analogy I've got for that is that if you have solar panels on the roof of your building, well, you can turn the light on when the sun's shining, but you can't turn it off when it goes dark. So that's the biggest problem. We need something in the middle that means that we can store that energy for reconversion at a later date. And there are numerous different technologies you can use to do that. Um, what hydrogen allows you to do is separate power from energy, which means that um, the amount of power you dump into a particular hydrogen-producing piece of equipment um, is not related necessarily to how much gas you store. Um, so unlike a battery where you're limited to how quickly you can charge it and how quickly you can discharge it, um, a hydrogen has got a very, very versatile role to play within the energy sector. Um, it also allows you to store energy for a long, long period. It can be sort of seasonal storage as opposed to sort of intraday storage, which is probably best done with batteries um, in the first place or supercapacitors. And what this allows you to do is to take waste energy or low-grade energy from the electricity sector or the energy sector uh, and use it to produce a high-grade fuel that you can then put into the automotive sector. Um, and that's what's really important about hydrogen, is that sector export ability. And we can look at very, uh, various different energy storage mechanisms, and, um, and uh, all of them have got a place within, within the requirement for energy storage. And as we try to increase the amount of renewables that we put onto the grid, the amount of wind turbines, the amount of hydro we put onto the grid, um, the requirement for energy storage is just going to increase alongside it. And that was actually discussed, if you ever get a chance to read it, there's a Boston Consultant Group report which describes the rollout of energy storage alongside renewable technologies. So you've got supercapacitors in there, excellent for, the, for sort of very, very short duration, small amounts of energy storage. Um, flywheels, again, short duration, small amounts of energy storage. And you can move up to sort of the, the battery technologies all the way up to the top right-hand corner where you can store very, very large amounts of energy for very, very long periods of time. Um, and technologies such as pumps, uh, pumped hydro storage there really, really win out. But the key here, the key point I wanted to make was that hydrogen can, can be used to, to store very, very small amounts of energy for short periods of time and can be used to store very, very large amounts of energy for long periods of time. So it's got a big playing ground 
um, within the energy storage market. So what we feel is that now there's never been more pressure with the increase in uh, renewable penetration on the grid. Um, there's never been a greater reason to look at hydrogen technologies. And, and, and there are several driving factors for that. Um, oil prices, obviously, fuel security, the need for energy storage. Um, an example is uh, in Denmark, they've got the capacity to meet about 20% of their annual demand on the grid scale from the wind turbines that they've got installed. Actually, they only meet 5% of it because the wind doesn't blow when the grid, the grid is demanding it its highest. That 15% is sold to France and is sold to Germany. And so the need for energy storage has become more and more important over these next years. And so the use for hydrogen and the, the applications for hydrogen becoming more and more important. And obviously, from an automotive market, the, um, the electric vehicle um, sales are really starting to stall. Um, as I understand it, Nissan Leaf has not sold very, very well. It's considerably undersold in the UK. Um, and, and part of that is due to the perception of battery technologies. Um, and what that allows um, us to, to have a look at and the opportunity for hydrogen is then to look at hydrogen as an automotive fuel or indeed a fuel for the waterways. In terms of awareness, um, I mean, uh, DEC, the Department for Energy and Climate Change, um, hydrogen energy storage now tops the list of their important, important research factors. Um, we personally have dealt with uh, Nick Clegg, um, as popular as he is, um, David McKay, Alex Salmond, heard him mentioned earlier on, um, Boris Johnson, Kit Malthouse, numerous different members of the official uh, uh, and of the parliament. And, um, and as I said, it's never, ever been more important on a, on a political agenda. So looking at the ways hydrogen can be produced then, um, uh, I do appreciate there's a member of BOC in the audience, so, uh, <laughs> hi. Um, so um, you might be able to correct me slightly on these figures. Um, but the vast majority, 93 95% of all hydrogen made, um, is made from, um, from CNG, so it's uh, via a process called steam methane reformation. Um, uh, we call this brown hydrogen, so if I mention it later on, this is what I'm referring to. Um, as a result, that produces CO2. Um, it's essentially the stripping of hydrogen from, from methane or, or natural gas, um, and as a result, CO2 is produced in its, uh, in its uh, production. Um, electrolysis um, currently, and this is the one that I think I'm probably going to get corrected on, but between 4 and 5% of, of global hydrogen production is via electrolysis, um, which can be at a distributed level, so it can be done very, very small, or can be done um, in a centralised fashion. And that obviously consumes elect uh, electricity. Uh, that electricity may be renewable or it may be grid-based. Um, a couple of new emerging technologies coming through, thermolysis, which is essentially um, very, very high temperature disassociation of water. So if you heat water to 2,500 degrees C, um, hydrogen and oxygen will spontaneously um, uh, be released. Uh, there are issues with thermal runaway on this, though, and um, this really at the sort of de design uh, uh, feasibility stage at the moment. In addition to that, there's photocatalysis. Um, uh, again, validation stages at present, but this is essentially using, using solar radiation to directly split water. So it basically takes away um, the inefficiency of the solar panel, so you've got a, a, a more direct route to hydrogen production. So our technology, um, uh, first thing, as I said, I didn't have a clue which order Steve goes through these slides on. Um, so, um, so for some reason, he's put the compliance slide in first. Um, but uh, the important thing to, to realise, um, I've heard it mentioned several times today, is, is that compliance has got to go alongside technical, um, technical development. Um, we work on um, uh, ISO 9001 principles. We're an ISO 9001 uh, rated company, which means we can self-certify to CE mark our products. We've also got ISO 14001, which is, um, I believe, health and safety, and another one, which is environment um, and, and waste. Um, so that means that we can CE mark our products to a series of different regulations, PED, Pressure Equipment Directive, um, TPED if that applies, which is a Transportable Pressure Equipment Directive, Low Voltage Directives, all of the, uh, all of the um, compliance issues within CE marking we are now experts in. Um, then there's com other compliance issues. So when it comes to the design of refuelling stations, we've heard it discussed earlier on today, 8 metre exclusion zones, things like that. All of those need to be decided based upon BCGA standards um, and, and HAZOPS, um, which is essentially the, the, um, the understanding and risk assessment of large-scale plant. Um, and then, obviously, we've got a series of different um, product standards that we need to comply to, um, which are specific to the type of product that they do. 
So looking at um, electrolysis then, this is what ITM does. Um, as I said, it's, it's probably the, the, the second, producer, second biggest producer of hydrogen globally. Um, but the real, the real um, uh, benefit of the form of electrolysis that we do um, is, is that it can um, facilitate the use of renewable energies. So it will accept a very, very widely fluctuating input. Um, it will take a wind turbine input and it will take a solar panel input. Um, and, and that means that it's truly an energy storage medium. Um, you, can, you can size the generation uh, very differently from the, from the demand. To give you an idea of that, um, a solar panel, one kilowatt, connected to a, to a, um, a hydrogen electrolyzer may produce 30 kilo kilograms over the year. Um, but you might leave that for three years before using that hydrogen. So you may have 90 kilos of storage as opposed to just a one kilowatt electrolyzer. That's the separation of power and energy. Um, PEM electrolyzers, which is the, the form of electrolysis that we, we do, um, really, uh, basically means that we can produce very, very high purity hydrogen directly from the stack. Um, the hydrogen comes off our stack at 99.99% pure, um, the major contaminants being oxygen and, uh, and water. So it's a very, very simple cleanup operation when compared to other forms of hydrogen production, sea methane reformation, and indeed um, alkali electrolysis. Um, we've got very, very small units, and we've got very, very... This is the fact that it's got a very, very low balance of plant load. It doesn't use any pumps, and it doesn't need to be cooled. The balance of plant load is around 5 watts, so of a 1.3 kilowatt load, let's say 0.05% of that goes to run the balance of plant. The rest of the energy goes straight into the production of hydrogen. That's quite important. Um, as I said, it's passively cooled, and it also produces oxygen at 15 bar. Um, so if you have a requirement for oxygen um, at fairly low pressures, and perhaps you had a, a means of cleaning it up and also pressurising it, um, then, then it would also facilitate those, those needs as well. Uh, that's HBOX solar in an exploded form, um, uh, and really the key bit is the bit in the middle, um, which kind of looks a bit like a clamshell. Um, uh, that's the, the electrolyzer stack, and it's rather unconventional when compared to other forms of electrolysis. Our large products um, are um, generally containerized. We use ISO shipping containers for ease of ease of, um, uh, of maneuverability. So we, these things are, are, can be coupled to trailers just as well as they can be coupled to, to um, container ships. Um, and essentially, the the bottom left hand corner there, we've got um, a 200 kilo a day refueler, uh, which has got two and a half days of energy storage. So the gas cylinders form the energy storage portion. It's got a very high conversion efficiency in the region of 65 to 75% efficiency. Um, and again, we can accept that intermittent input. From those products, we have to approach um, different markets. And, and these are really the, the, the ones that we're focusing on at the moment. Clean fuel, so this is the provision of hydrogen for uh, refueling vehicles, refueling um, be they captive fleets or indeed um, uh, uh, roaming fleets such as um, sort of uh, the more generic automotive market. We've got energy storage projects which is more looking at grid scale renewable energy storage. Um, we've got projects looking at gas injection. Um, and then we've got renewable heat which is more of a development project which is um, uh, looking at uh, the, the use of hydrogen as a, as a form of heat. So in terms of clean fuel, this is the sort of thing that we're producing at the moment. This is, um, this is H-Fuel. Um, as a platform, it's scalable from 5 kilos a day all the way up to about um, 100, 200 kilos a day. Um, this unit here is, uh, is, is actually at the University of Nottingham um, now, and that's a 5 kilo a day with, with refueling for the microcab vehicles that they're using there. Uh, an example of a large one, this is, um, this is a 15 kilo a day unit, again, um, based on the same h field platform, and uh, this actually uses uh, three 5 kilo a day electrolyzer modules. Um, so when we use these, these, um, these uh, h field products, what it allows us to do is produce hydrogen on site from renewables, meaning that there's zero carbon in the production of the hydrogen. So there's no carbon chain associated with the production of hydrogen. Because of the fact we produce it at the point of use, so these, these units are designed to be positioned remotely, local to any refueling, um, uh, any vehicles to be refueled. Um, it means that we have zero carbon relating to the transportation of the fuel, and that, as discussed earlier, is, is sometimes an issue. And then finally, as with all hydrogen technology, there's zero carbon emissions when it's consumed in a fuel cell or an internal combustion engine. Our costs at the moment... Um, just for reference, when amortised over a 10-year basis, um, we, we, we're actually achieving lower than gasoline costs at £5 per kilo. Um, 
one of the projects we're involved in, uh, actually alongside BOC and, and many others, um, is UK H2 Mobility. Um, and this project is really to uh, de determine the rollout of hydrogen infrastructure in the UK. Now, it's already been done in Germany. Um, they've, they've done their own uh, German U uh, H2 Mobility uh, scheme. Um, and there's a plan to build 1,000 stations by 2014 in Germany. They've got 2.6 billion euros of investment in hydrogen infrastructure. So this is happening. Um, what it isn't doing is, is happening necessarily in the UK, and it's certainly, certainly um, uh, the fact that we are following the Germans on this. Japan have their own uh, rollout plan as well, um, and the US at the moment are struggling to, struggling to develop one. Um, in terms of who's involved in the project, um, as I said, BOC, ourselves, um, there's a few more gas players in there, uh, Toyota, Daimler, Nissan, Vauxhall, Hyundai, alongside some of the energy, energy guys, and three, three, um, uh, three uh, governmental bodies, so that's DEC, BIS, and DOT. Um, we're also involved in a project called Eco Island, which is the, uh, looking at the, um, the ability to turn the Isle of Wight into a net producer of energy. Um, we're installing a 100 kilo a day refueler on the island um, alongside 20 vehicles um, and we're actually also putting into that um, smart grid networks, flow batteries and, um, and a data cloud which will do all the analysis on, on, on the island. It's the first stage, really there's probably three stages to Eco Island before they can start thinking about turning the grid connection around. Um, but the great thing about it is that one, uh, positioning one refueler on the island would serve every vehicle on the island. It's a 27 mile round, the island. And so any vehicle with, with greater than sort of 50 or 60 miles range could be served from that one point of refuel. Um, we find that when you put a refueling station in the middle of the UK, it tends to be diluted by the population mass in the area. So you put a refueling station in Leicester, and people from Cornwall feel a bit, bit upset because they can't refuel their hydrogen vehicles. But what's really nice is there's this not, not, not only physical but a mental boundary to the fact that they only will ever have to go to the coast and, and around that coast is 27 miles. There's also consideration within this project for uh, a hydrogen boat. Um, uh, we've got a partnership and an MOE in place with, um, with Cheetah Marine um, who produce um, some very, very quick deploying catamarans uh, style vehicles, uh, sorry, boats. Um, and, uh, and in that, it, within the project, there will be some consideration of whether we can make those into hydrogen operation. So in terms of hydrogen for boats then, um, well, um, there's obviously limited control of emissions from boats um, and waterways quite often go through rural land. So the fact is there's, there's actually quite a good resource for solar, wind and hydro technologies. Um, obviously the electrolysis, as I've described, it can be directly coupled to those renewables and the hydrogen produced can then be used to refuel the, re refuel the boats. What's, what's, what's really key about this is actually a boat is, is essentially a captive fleet, especially on the UK waterways, as long as they stay within the UK. Um, so much like uh, fuel cell trucks in a sort of uh, centralised regional distribution warehouse, um, uh, our boats within, within the canal network are actually um, only ever going to pass certain points on a regular basis. And that means the rollout of hydrogen infrastructure on those, on those waterways can be considerably more simple than would be required on, on, the, on the road networks. Um, in addition, uh, you can probably look to lower the refuelling pressures. I know obviously um, certain, certain vessels uh, use hydro storage and so there isn't a requirement for pressure really at all. Um, but it might mean that you can move from 350 bar to 250 bar, which reduces cost. Um, and, um, and, and the real thing to, to, to that we feel with regarding um, uh, putting hydrogen on the, on the uh, waterways is that we need to get the government's awareness up on the matter such that they can uh, start to support projects on the waterways. At the moment, it does tend to be very much automotive focused in the UK. Um, so um, just some brief facts, I don't know why he's put these in, but uh, some brief facts, and, and these, I think Rex, you supplied some of these, so, so if anybody's got any questions or, or arguments for them, Rex is your man. Um, so we've got about 2,200 miles of waterway in the UK, and about 29,000 registered boats. I think I heard 60,000 earlier on, so I'm going to brush over that. Right. And, and the majority of those boats are highly underutilised. They're not 100% utilised. Um, very few of them are moving 100% of the time. Um, and so, as I said, they're captive fleet. Um, and an example narrowboat might consume about 200 litres a year of diesel. So that's, that's, that's about one litre an hour. Um, I think that's a reasonable number. These are coming from sort of broad estimates from, from um, Google searching, I believe. Um, 
So what that equates to is an energy consumption of about 10 kilowatt hours per hour um, when they're actually operational. Um, now, we took the, the numbers that, that you gave us for, for your narrowboat, and, and we did a little bit of backwards calculation, and, and we actually came up with 8 kilowatt hours per hour. So you've got about a, a let's say, a 20% reduction then in overall energy throughput, not including the production of hydrogen. And that means that the average narrowboat would consume about 50 kilos a year of hydrogen to do all of its movements within the UK waterways. To give you an idea, a 200 kilo a day refueler would produce, oh goodness, uh, probably I'd have to do the calculation, but uh, you'd only need about 2,200 kilo a day refuelers to be able to satisfy the entire fleet of, um, of boats on the UK waterways if you do that calculation. It's then just a matter of how much storage you need. If they're all going to refuel in the middle of summer, it can become a bit of a logistical nightmare, but uh, nevertheless. So anyway, um, moving on. Um, we do feel hydrogen, um, as a company, we do feel that the hydrogen is a viable um, uh, solution to uh, zero carbon um, uh, production on, on the UK waterways. It is not something we've been involved with actively before, um, but it, um, it is something that we, we would encourage. And if anybody's got any interest in electrolysis, then please come and see us and we'll, um, we'll, we'll see if we can, we can work on projects together. The electrolysis and the equipment that we produce is well proven um, and, uh, and we have got refueling stations ready to deploy um, alongside the UKH new mobility work. Um, and the rural location of what waterways does support the, the integration of renewable energies um, uh, and therefore zero carbon production of hydrogen. Um, we need to start getting uh, government ministers and, and the political um, pressure on to, um, to, to support projects within the waterways. Um, and, and our impression is that it's actually completely off the radar at present. The guys who have managed to get funding from, from government bodies, and I know, Jazz, you've, you've, you've got some funding, you've done very, very well to achieve it in our, in our eyes because, because of the fact that it is so, so off the radar. Um, uh, so, um, as I said, if you do have any questions about our technology, um, we do see it as a key, key opening market. It is a niche market, but it is a market that we wouldn't want to be involved in, so please come and see us, um, and, uh, and we'll do our best to answer any questions you have about it. So, uh, so that's everything. Thanks very much. And uh, any questions? So. Was in there, so that was good. Um, we we work in obviously in as long as time as possible because that makes the the economic life value. As how long, well, we give a year guarantee with any of our any of our equipment, but that's the minimum we have to give. Um, in terms of longevity, it does depend very much on how you use it. For instance, um, if we take the HBox Solar product as an example, um, the HBox Solar product that's got a very very high efficiency, and actually the reason it's such high efficiency is because for the majority of the time it's run at very very low current density. As soon as you run an electro uh, electrolyzer at very very low current density, the degradation to catalysis happens much more slowly. Um, and so that product we would be happier to support for, for a longer period of time. Um, in answer to your question, I can't really answer it, it's certainly not here in a public forum, but also I, I, I don't know whether we can genuinely answer it from, from a director level. But if you want to come and have a discussion about that afterwards, then we'll be more than happy. So I know that's a woolly answer, but I genuinely do not know the answer. So, yeah. John? Something like 100 kilos a day is, is, is going to be the upwards hundreds of thousands of pounds. Oh, yeah, it's going to be at the top end of the hundreds of thousands of pounds, getting on for the sort of millions of pounds. Yeah, it's going to be, going to be in that region. Obviously, it depends uh, quite considerably upon, upon the type of storage you want. If you want 700 bar storage, that changes, changes things. 700 bar with refuel into vehicles. Um, to give you an idea, if we were talking about 200 kilos of gas storage, um, uh, then if you wanted dumb storage at 250 bar without a refueling capability to a vehicle, that would probably be about 80,000 um, pounds. If you look at 200 kilos um, at 700 bar with all the refueling, you might be talking at more like 150 to 160,000 um, pounds. So you've got, you've got the, the specification of the system really is, is, is the devil in the detail there. It, it's, it's what dictates the, the total cost. And the compression technology, presumably, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, if we go to 700 bar, there's a, there's a whole load more compression um, issues and technologies that we need to consider. Okay, so yeah. the thing is self-containing, yep. it doesn't use its external passes. How does it compress the hydrogen once it's separated the, the it, it, Generally speaking, it compresses, uh, compresses the hydrogen in series with the, the, the production. So as it's produced, it's produced at 15 bar, it's put into a buffer store, and then the compressor will run from the same power supply. So it has to be primed. Yeah, there's a buffer store, yeah, there's 50 bar buffer store, and that, and that then compresses it to 250, 350, and 410 bar. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay. Okay. Graham, you've gone, and then you, uh, so you behind you, and then, and then now, now I come to you. So there's no power stores on the, on the Isle of Wight? Uh, there's, well, uh, the, the Isle of Wight is, um, is, is obviously grid tied. Um, it, it's got a very, very large cable coming across from Portsmouth at the moment, and, um, and, uh, their, their ambition is to turn it round. Now, the, re the, the only way they're going to be able to do that is by integrating a massive amount of renewables on the island. Um, they're talking about, they've, I think they've got a couple of megawatt solar farms uh, going in. They've got um, uh, Vestas wind turbines are based on the island, and they're going to be erecting a, a considerable amount of wind. They've got some tidal work as well going in on the island. Um, so all of those, those, those technologies will go to mean they're a net producer of, of energy as opposed to a consumer. Yeah. The output from the cell is uh, oxygen and water. Yeah. You strip those out. That that feed is then perfectly acceptable for a fuel cell. Yes. Percentage. Yeah. We no we. It's it's a very um it's a very interesting one. You should ask that, actually. The automotive guys have got a standard for the cleanliness of their hydrogen. Um, and the cleanly, w w essentially it was written by a load of guys who, who, who are car manufacturers as opposed to a load of guys who understand gas production. Um, and they've required 5.9 purity and they've, there are certain limits on the amount of sulfur that can be in there, uh, the amount of ammonia that can be in there, etc. Um, actually, globally, there isn't a lab that can measure to those levels. Um, and so we've engaged with the National Physics Laboratory um, in doing the analysis of our gas. Um, and actually, um, there is an argument in the, within those standards that hydrogen from electrolysis, be it alkali or PEM electrolysis, should have to go through different standards because the only things that can, the only contaminants that can be present are oxygen and water, and they're not poisons to fuel cells. When you look at steam methane re reformed hydrogen, for instance, then there may be CO in there, which would be a poison, um, and there may be other contaminants in there depending upon the cleanliness of the CNG stream on the way in. Can, it, it can be, but it's in such low amounts yeah. on, on electrolyzers that it's... it's it anyway. Yeah, so th there is actually a pressure on the ISO board to move towards two standards. One, hydrogen purity from electrolyzers, which should have an, a let-up because of the fact it won't have any of the nastiness in it. Um, and then hydrogen produced from other means, um, including, including very, very hydrogen. Your operating experience of taking the steam up there. Yeah. It would fairly look warm about hydrogen in that boat, but uh, rather not chemical. But I think Adrian went to a talk of his in Oxford, and he was very positive about hydrogen there. Mm. So yeah, there's there's uh, definitely been a swing. Suns, I think. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, at least we've got another. We've got somebody on the inside who is actually supporting the case for mm. energy storage using hydrogen. Yeah. Which is that's encouraging. Yeah. Uh, with the uh, waterways, uh, we've, we've had a bit more time, but as you say, you know, a lot of it is um, uh, very static. Yeah. Live around, but I don't know how they're going to get your uh, fuel stations. Yeah. Uh, but, but I work with a, 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 a fuel boat that delivers coal and diesel and mm -hmm. so on. Uh, could there be any way that there could be a, a, a moving uh, a supply of hydrogen? Absolutely, but with that movement becomes a carbon footprint associated. No, no, we could do this on a hydrogen. You could put it on a hydrogen vessel. <laughs> um, we could fill a boat with a metal hydride. Yes, well, yeah, well, yes, yes. Yeah. 20 meter exclusion. <laughs> <laughs> you, can't, you can have it on board the boat, but you can't get on the boat. Well, it's not this installation. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Anyway, you, you, you would um, uh, bear that in mind, though, that uh, yeah. it would be mo mobile. Uh, yeah, and I mean, all of our refueling stations, as I said, they are ISO containers so they can be transported. Uh, they are ADR, yeah. and, and I know there's been a lot of question about the MCA as well, and they have been approved for going across water as well. So, so um, they can actually go across uh, national boundaries as well. Yeah. So with with a, a, a container a unit on, on a boat, would it have to have a, an energy supply too? 
Yeah, very, very low for refueling though, because all it needs to do is open, open, open some solenoids. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. and power a PLC. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 500 kilo, that's uh, 25 quid for a full tank of petrol. Uh, well, yeah, uh, yeah, but obviously energetically you don't no have tax. as much on board the vehicle, and there's no tax. Um, and that's an interesting point, actually. The, the government have got some tax incentives to work out, I think. Um, and uh, <laughs> um, Well, I, I'm, I'm still waiting for the day that the Chancellor can come out rubbing his hands when it's raining and, uh, and, and enjoy all the tax he's going to be getting. But um, no, it's, um, it's, it's an interesting one because, because technically you're taxed on your electricity as well. So you shouldn't really be taxed if you're producing it yourself. But that's our argument. Okay. But I'm sure BOC are being taxed on their CNG as well, so. Thanks very much, Steve. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank Lovely. You Thank you very much. Yeah.